and welcome to this edition of Trader Talk TV and we're coming live from our office but not for long because we're moving shop in a couple of weeks very exciting times here at Exchange Wire. Today we've got Thomas from Zander in the office. Thomas how are you? Very well thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, good. Thanks for coming in today and we're talking about today about sort of the programmatic approach to broadcasting because it's a little bit different from your traditional web display and there's a lot involved so we're going to talk about the creative piece and the ID piece. Before we do that Thomas could you talk a little bit about yourself a little bit about Xander. Yeah, sure. So I'm a solutions engineer at Xander. I've been with the company uh, just under five years. So I primarily work with um, some of our broadcaster clients, looking at how we can bring the broadcaster supply onto our uh, platform, as well as uh, buyers that want to access that supply. Brilliant. And uh, so today we're going to kick off because a lot of people just assume that you can just you know, take one programmatic format and just slap it on a channel and think that's it, right? But broadcasting is quite complicated. And today we're going to talk about two areas that are, are of huge importance when it comes to sort of programmatic in, pro, in broadcasting. So I want to talk about the first one, which is creative, right? There's a huge, you know, huge sort of uh, process around creative in this country and other countries. Lots of sort of uh, regulatory bodies that check the validity uh, and whether or not ads are telling the truth. So let's talk about that. Thomas, and talk about what exactly is involved in that process, because people hear about Ofcom and ASA and advertisers getting fined and all sorts of crack, but there is an interesting process here. There's like, I think there's a process called um, Clearcast, which is involved in that process. Yep. Can you talk a bit about that first? Because I want to talk about that first and then talk about how programmatic and automation is making that process easier. But let's first talk about that, because it's a huge hurdle for a lot of companies trying to get into that space. Absolutely, sure. So to start off with, the uh, UK broadcast environment is very heavily regulated uh, and there's sort of two sort of players in this space to think about. So to begin with, we have Ofcom yeah, and we have the ASA. Yeah. So ASA is the Advertising Standards Authority. So they are basically responsible for making sure that there is a framework of rules uh, and regulations in place um, for broadcasters and advertisers to make sure that the creatives are compliant with a number of things. So that yeah. can be the kinds of content that is shown in the creative, yeah. uh, the kinds of words that are allowed in the script and things like that. Okay. And you just mentioned Clearcast. So Clearcast yes. are uh, an entity um, who are made up of the sort of four major broadcasters in the UK. So you've got Channel 4, uh, Sky, ITV, and actually Warner Media. Warner Media. Yeah, okay, interestingly, interesting. yeah. So Clearcast are responsible for sort of pre-screening and auditing creatives before they're eligible to um, be ser sort of served across that broadcast yeah. inventory. So let's talk about the current process, right? I would love to go through a workflow of this because yeah. I, I'm, you know, I know some of this, but I'm not au okay fait with the how a five billion dollar or five sorry billion pounds industry works. So. Talk about how this process works. So yeah, let's talk sure. about the creative agency, developing the creative, right? Where does it go? Who sort of like checks the box? How does it actually get played on my TV from a Coronation Street episode? Yeah, sure. So maybe let's start off uh, on the workflow here. So firstly, we start off with the creative agency. Yeah. So they're going to be responsible for um, actually producing the creative, yeah. right? Creating, writing the scripts, producing all the visuals there. And so what they do is they work very early on in the process with Clearcast. Okay. Uh, during the scripting phase. So at the very beginning of the creative process, Clearcast will be involved and they will review the script. So even before any filming or production is done, they'll check the script to make sure that it's sort of good to go from a, a script perspe perspective. Yeah. Um, usually that process takes about two to three days. Okay. Um, and so the creative agent, if all's good with the script, the creative agency is going to go ahead and produce the, you know, the full sort of creative. Yeah. And Clearcast are going to review the full creative, and that's going to take usually about two to three weeks. Two to three weeks. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what Clearcast will do when the creative is ready is they will they will literally watch the creative. They'll have a team that will sit down, watch the creative end to end make sure that it passes all of the regulations like around uh, sort of flat, the kinds of flashing images, the intensity of flashing images, whether or not the product is accurately represented, like all the sort of rules and regulations that need to be checked. Right. Yeah. 
yeah. You think about all the rubbish on Facebook, hey, compared to this, like exactly, yeah. So it's very different, obviously, to the kind of the digital yeah. display world. Um, so if all's good with the creative, what Clearcast will do is they'll issue what's called a clock number. Okay. And what the creative agency can then do is provide the creative to the advertiser. Yeah. Or the buyer or the agency. So or the agency's buying yeah. the half, yeah. Exactly. So they'll provide the creative with the clock number. And what the advertiser will then do is then pass that creative over to the broadcaster. Right. And if all's good with that creative, the broadcaster is going to take that creative and upload it into their CDN, into the cloud. Yeah. So that's ready to serve. That's going to be transcoded into lots of different formats so it you know, serves nicely on set-top boxes, etc. Right. The challenge is when you've got sort of a feedback loop here. So if there's an issue with the creative, right, uh, maybe it's, I don't know, the advertiser's given the broadcaster the wrong format or the bit rate is incorrect or something it doesn't meet the ad the broadcaster's requirements there's got to be a feedback loop back to the advertiser who then may even need to go back to the creative agency yeah um to correct that so what you're looking at here is a timeline of sort of what well, what we see is sort of four to six weeks four to six weeks yeah maybe even longer right depending on how many sort of hops there are back and forth in this okay chain. Yeah. let's uh, ask the obvious question here right for for a sort of a, a process of programmatic advertising which works in milliseconds, how do we sort of get our heads around this sort of gap between creative control and actual execution of six four to six weeks? Yeah, I mean it's it's very different, right, to what we're used to in the display environment where you can upload a creative into your DSP and you can be up Line. and running in half an hour. You yeah. might have an exchange level audit or something like that, but really it's uh, there's just nowhere near this level of Due diligence, right? All so. right. So we're, we're establishing here that, that broadcasting programmatic is very different, right? There is a, a huge sort of regulatory legislative sort of um, framework that you have to adhere to. So how can sort of ad tech um, or even automation sort of just sort of optimize this process, right? So you're talking yeah. four to six weeks. How do we get down to a, a shorter time frame that allows sort of like data-driven, hungry sort of advertisers to... to execute and optimize their ads yeah sure so uh, where we're seeing ad tech sort of helping and adding value here is sort of in this stage so in the interaction between the advertiser and the broadcaster right. pre-campaign okay yeah so there's a couple of concepts that i can take you through right now if i can clear some space yeah of course so let's just clear that a bit of elbow grease there that's it there we go the trailer talk workout as well as uh, you know education yeah, this is quite a... at the same time okay so the first one that i want to take you through is sort of the pre-registration right so this happens prior to the campaign okay so this is a way for a dsp to register a creative with the broadcaster And this will typically be an API call yeah. to the broadcaster ad server. So what we're doing here is we're sort of automating this part of the process okay. where the advertiser has to pass the creative to the broadcaster. Um, what this API call actually looks like in the payload will actually be a, um, an actual example of the creative. Yeah. So if you've ever heard of Vast. Yes. Yeah. So video ad serving template. This is an XML file that's included in the API call. And as an industry, we've agreed to include what we call a universal ad ID node. Yeah. Add ID. So this is a XML node that's included with all the other regular stuff that you include in the VAST document. And that will include the clock ID that has been provided by Clearcast. Okay. And what the broadcaster can then do is they can either approve or disapprove that creative. If all's good with that creative, it can go up into the CDN. And be executed. So as, we, as they do here, and that can then be transcoded, et cetera, in the broadcaster's infrastructure. Okay. What we can also do is request a status update. So we can say to the broadcaster, can you give me a status update? So that's another API call. 
and we can pull down the status so we can see whether or not it's been approved or whether it was rejected. Right. So does that, does that help to condense that, that period of four to six weeks? So what, what are we talking about then if we have all this in place? So it's, what we're finding is that um, this helps broadcasters to really increase the volume of creatives right, that, okay. they can, they can um, that they can evaluate. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. As demand from, uh, or buyers that want to access this demand through DSPs increases, uh, this is very important for them to have a workflow. Yeah. Uh, where they can uh, really sort of review the creatives in a, in a structured way rather yeah. than sort of having meetings and going back and forth over email as, as you would do in sort of this, this legacy workflow. Okay. Uh, the second part of this Trader Talk special is going to focus on uh, the ID. Obviously, creatives are a huge you know, um, piece of the broadcast and programmatic space. There's a lot of like, nuance to it, as we discussed. But IDs are equally sort of, uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot to be sort of uh, worked around there. So particularly IDs, because they are um, more sell side focused. Yep. The power is with the, the, the walled gardens. I want to talk a little bit about that. Like as, a, as an ad tech vendor and as a platform, how do you work in that sort of environment? Because, you know, in display, web-based display, effectively the DSPs have all the contextual, all the first party data. But it's very different in broadcasting. Uh, yep. So let's talk a little bit about that because that's fascinating stuff. I don't think people realize the extent to which ITV or Channel 4 or all, all these sort of like war gardens have the data effectively. Yeah, sure. So if you think about your sort of favorite BVOD service, um, you, you probably signed up for it uh, by giving your sort of email address. Yeah. Uh, you probably gave them your phone number, maybe even your home address. Um, so uh, these the broadcasters have you know built up trust with consumers. They produce quality content, and in exchange for that, yeah, you uh, provide them with your personal information. Yeah. Um, but what we're finding really is that uh, as a broadcaster, they don't just want to pass that information or pass an ID anyway yeah. directly into the to the bid stream, right? There's it's not a um, sort of in the broadcaster's interests from a privacy perspective. Yeah. And from a monetization perspective. So how would yeah. how would an advertiser work in that environment? Like, see, what what way do you work? Yeah, with these work? I'm just curious. Like, so, you don't necessarily talk about relationship you you have, but from a, from a you know helicopter view, how would you work with these wall guys? So typically, the um, advertiser can provide a broadcaster with an export from a CRM, which could include um, things like email. Yeah. And this is where I think the role of things like the clean room can become a bit more interesting, um, you know, a bit more clear. So on the broadcaster side, you know, you can have a, a clean room and on the um, advertiser side, he's got his clean room. Um, what we're finding is that the broadcaster can sort of take that um, sort of intersection of the two pieces of data yeah. and apply that targeting on the sell side. So. Yeah. Still, there's no information provided in the bid stream, but what the buyer then has is a sort of a targetable yeah, yeah. deal ID yeah, yeah, absolutely. that they can access through a DSP. I'm curious exactly. to know, do you think that, let's just say around the clean room phenomenal, right? Um, advertisers are going to have their own clean rooms, right? And the likes of the Wall Gardens, the ITVs, Channel 4, yep. uh, Disney's, et cetera, will have their own Wall Garden. Do you think that, oh, sorry, um, uh, clean rooms, do you think that the clean room on the sell side is where the data will be joined, uh, aggregated and segmented, and then activated on the first party data, first party basis on their their own domain? I think so for now, it's, yeah. it's, 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 that's sort of the likely scenario. We're only really seeing V1 of this sort of whole process this right where, stuff. so, yeah, yeah. And do you think that's, the, that, that's probably the, the post uh, ID post cookie way of doing stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the beauty of this environment is that you're not relying on a cookie to begin with, exactly. right? Because there's no, you know, yeah, there's no panic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I just want to just follow on from that. This type of innovation around, um, you know, the automation of these processes, right? So TV has been very much legacy driven, like obviously has got barb and we kind of have innovated in that way. When TV is kind of like evolved into a, a five billion pound business. But this type of automation, I just want to talk briefly talk about this towards the end of this, is the trade talk is the democratization of TV, right? There's lots of talk about direct to consumer brands making the jump into TV. And I'm talking from a Xander perspective yeah. because I'm sure you're seeing now these type of brands coming in. What what sort of attracted them to the space? 
because it's been very difficult. They're always in the same 100 or 200 big brands buying TV, yep. running campaigns, etc. What's changed right now? And talk about that automation piece, dem democratizing access. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, with these sort of these lengthy processes uh, becoming more automated, what we're finding is that, um, you know, you've got your more so kind of data savvy um, and sort of D2C startup style brands that are starting to invest in TV a bit more. And um, in addition to that, sort of they're thinking about campaigns not just in sort of a branding from branding perspective, yeah. but also from a sort of a more direct response perspective. So interesting. Um, You're, you know, uh, you, do you see that performance piece creeping into TV? I, like, yeah, I mean, obviously we, reach and frequency has been a lot of the you know the fundamental measurement piece of TV. Yeah. How is that changing? I'm curious how how from a from like a you know you guys work on buy side and sell side. You got that platform. Yeah. So I'd love to see understand how that performance piece is that now and sort of in, in kind of embedding itself in tv yeah so i mean it all comes down to the creative right yes um, well that's one of the most important elements so um and we know that um you know tv can be one of the biggest drivers for search for example so what we see uh brands doing typically is sort of investing really heavily in sort of compelling creative that can drive you know consumers to take an action okay so. very good very good um, so where do you think we're going to move to next right so we're trying to get our creative down. We're trying to get an idea. How do you bring all that together? We're we going to have a seamless sort of process now of buying TV because it, it, this is the exciting part. Like you, like you know, um, TV. Like if you think about it, YouTube is sort of stolen the march on CTV you know, on sort of uh, data-driven TV buying, right? Arguably, but the broadcasters now have kind of caught the bug. They they see the opportunity here. Yeah, sure. So I think um, what we're not necessarily looking to do is to kind of disrupt the whole process, but yes. to really provide a kind of a very seamless access to this supply to begin with. So like I said, we're sort of still see seeing sort of V1 of this process. So this yeah. whole sort of automation piece is really something that we're going to be working on really, so I'd expect, throughout this whole year. So you're you thinking know. about working within a very you know well-established, huge market and saying, exactly. look, we're talking about growing the pie rather than tinkering with your model. Exactly. For, I think, you know, initially it's about kind of lowering the barrier to entry, automating, adding automation where possible, yeah. for example, in the in the creative process. Um, and I think there's uh, there's other areas where we can add value, right, as a, as a platform. So even if you think about the creative process where we send the creative to the broadcaster, what we're thinking about is how we can even improve the buyer's experience. Um, to be, even before we send the creative off, okay. so doing the checks against the broadcaster specs in the DSP. So you, you yeah. think that we could actually automate this even more, to create a piece yes. even more? Yes, yes, yeah. So a lot of a lot of people happy with that. Um, Thomas, thanks for that. That was an interesting one. Through, yeah, thanks for having me. Because like that type of stuff is really important for people to understand. Broadcasting is a very complicated space and very different from our digital world. So thanks for coming through today and, and running us through the ID piece and the creative piece, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And we'll see you next time on Trader Talk TV. Thank you.